Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Van Ostrin, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Key Trends in Social Science Research, sponsored by ProQuest and featuring Rob Newman and Mark Ayling. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. Please feel free to submit these throughout the program. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. And now for some background on today's presenters. Rob Newman is Senior Product Manager for the ProQuest Social Sciences Portfolio. He has been with ProQuest for over 10 years in various product management roles based in Cambridge, UK office. Mark Ayling is the Product Marketing Manager for Social Sciences, Business, Multidisciplinary, and Statistics. He has worked at the ProQuest Cambridge office for four years, previously working for a UK-based academic publisher. ProQuest proprietary index databases in the social sciences include sociological abstracts, worldwide political science abstracts, and international bibliography of the social sciences, which provide in-depth abstracting and indexing coverage of the scholarly literature across a range of social science disciplines. These can be combined with full-text databases that bring together journals, dissertations, and other resources. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Mark. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for um, joining us today. Uh, we've got some interesting findings from conversations and more formal research that we've been carrying out, and I'm glad that um, so many of you are going to be able to um, share this with us. Um, also, thanks to many of you that have participated in any of our focus groups, interviews, or surveys. Um, this kind of input is essential to what we do, and um, it helps us every day. Uh, there'll also be a survey um, a little later in the presentation, and thanks for filling in the um, poll that was in the lobby area of the um, presentation. So here's what we're going to be covering today. I'm going to start off by talking about um, identifying problems and needs and then move on to a specific uh, survey that we've carried out recently. And we spend a lot of time talking to researchers about various aspects of their research workflow. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to Rob, who's um, going to talk about uh, some research we've done on how researchers use online resources, um, what they actually use, how they find that experience, and also the role of abstract and indexing. So, Research on researchers, why do we do this? So we spend a lot of time talking to librarians to better understand their needs, but we also need to talk to researchers as they're the people that are actually carrying out the research and using the products that we create. So it's easy to assume that you uh, know what the users want and make products built on those assumptions. So this image is taken from a book called The Design of Everyday Things. Um, and that talks about how when designing products, the designers need to fully understand the potential user their needs and what their problems are. So if you lose sight of this, you can end up with something like that, which is very elegant and stylish, but if what you want is a cup of coffee, uh, it's not a lot of use. So the same goes for us and how we develop our products. So we get this information in a number of ways. We use surveys, um, and we also use face-to-face -face interviews and focus groups. Um, we often have conversations in focus groups or um, less formally at conferences or libraries, and common problems and themes emerge from those. Um, we then look for more information, uh, maybe in the form of further conversations or looking for formalized data in the form of a survey um, like the one up on the screen there. Um, so just over the past year, we've surveyed thousands of researchers. Um, there's an example of one of the questions we may ask them there. So some of the common problems that come out of these um, often can be grouped together and trends can emerge from this. So um, here's a few of the, of, the, of the problems that come out of these conversations. So generally, researchers don't have much time. Um, 
research can sometimes be seen as playing a secondary role to teaching. Um, so they need their research to be easy and fast. So you can see a few quotes there. I need to find information right away. Um, or I want to search across as much information as possible and get it all organized. Basically, there's time pressures, and they don't want to be spending more time than is absolutely necessary finding what they need. There's also a lot of information out there, a lot of information sources. So they need some way to validate the information. Um, so I get too many results when I search, or I don't know what the most important journals outside my field are. Um, the one in the top right there really gets to the heart of the problem. I use Google, but it's endless, and you have to sift through a lot of stuff. It would be great to be able to search something that was limited to credible, useful material. So the information is out there, but making sense of it um, can be a challenge. Um, often they need access to the latest information, especially in um, certain cutting-edge fields. Um, one of the quotes there, I need to know what's in progress. Published papers are two years out of date. Um, often they need to keep up to date with the scholarship more widely, as well as um, wider factors that may indirectly affect their field. One of the biggest um, problems that we hear a lot is up in the top left that I'm terrified of missing stuff. Um, it's this fear of missing all the relevant articles that relate to their research, particularly when doing their literature review. I spoke to a researcher a while ago who um, who said that she was worried that she might submit a paper for peer review and not cite a paper written by one of the reviewers. Perhaps the worst case scenario for um, missing a piece of information that they really should have seen. So this is a specific survey that um, we've been carrying out recently. Um, and really, it comes from one thing that has clearly emerged from talking to their researchers. So while scholarly researchers are valuable to their research, and we know that they, um, that they use scholarly journals, sorry, uh, and a key objective of theirs is to get published in them, there's other types of information that they routinely use in their information, uh, uh, sorry, in their research that um, just isn't covered by scholarly journals. Uh, so this survey was sent out to social sciences faculty worldwide, and we got responses from over 350 researchers. Uh, the question we asked was, Please indicate whether you use the following sources of information for research, including those used for staying current in your field and generating ideas, as well as actively researching a topic for a paper. So we asked you a very similar question in the lobby. So maybe we can have a look at the results of the lobby survey. Or maybe we can do that afterwards. So thanks to everyone that filled in um, the poll in the lobby. I think people are still filling it in now. As you can see, there's quite, a, quite some, some quite high results on there. Um, probably the most common is e-books, conference proceedings, dissertations, uh, data is up there as well, and abstracts. So that's still changing. Maybe we'll come back to that a bit later. So let's see um, the results of our survey. So the first thing to note is that a lot of these numbers are very high. Um, and these numbers really back up what researchers have been telling us, that they really are using a lot of different types of content within their research. And a lot of these types of content fit into common problems, um, some of which we talked about earlier. So one of the things we mentioned earlier was uh, timeliness, needing to find the really cutting edge research. So um, conference proceedings, working papers, and dissertations. So they're, all three of those are right at the top, 77, 75, and 75 percent. Um, of respondents say so they use this content. So this not only gives a complete picture of um, the scholarship in the field, but also allows them to see uh, the latest thinking first without having to wait for it to go through peer review and be published. Uh, there are many examples of articles that started life of, uh, as working papers and could be found in a repository two or three years before publication in a journal, um, with very few, if any, changes uh, to the text itself. Another one quite high up is newspapers. Um, Many of the fields of study are either directly or indirectly affected by wider issues. Um, 
researchers often tell us they need to stay on top of this. Uh, as well as that, um, they often need to search back file for other factors, for example, political decisions or business research, that, uh, business results that could affect their field of study. Um, probably an unsurprising uh, one there is raw data. I think that was quite high on the lobby poll as well. 77% of the respondents says they used that in their research. So not only can this supplement a researcher's primary data uh, and can inform areas to study, but it can also give uh, context or background uh, to other trends they may have identified. Um, we've also heard that while this is becoming more and more available, uh, often for free online, it's still very difficult to organize and normalize this. Um, many different sources providing different parts of data uh, or different uh, sets of data. So there are still plenty of challenges for researchers in actually using it. Just interesting to show, we um, last year we conducted the same, uh, we asked business researchers the same question. Um, so there's 570 business researchers responded here, and you can see their responses in gray. So it's actually even slightly higher than social scientists, but still um, very high and quite consistent with, um, with the numbers for social sciences. So with researchers using all of these different content types, it's down to us to make them as easy to discover as possible. Um, and you can almost divide these content types into, into two groups, uh, traditional scholarly resources offering established ideas and authoritative viewpoints on topics of interest, so, such as books and dissertations, uh, news sources and scholarly journals, and then raw data um, offering insights into how things are being studied rather than what's being studied. Um, so conference proceedings, working papers, data, and trade publications. So this can pose challenges for all of us. Um, for example, will faculty, if, if faculty can't access this content quickly and easily in the library, um, will they go looking for content themselves? Will they buy it themselves? Um, which might raise questions as to why they couldn't find it in the library or why they couldn't find it on ProQuest. Uh, can faculty ensure research and learning outcomes will be optimal? Will students turn to Google for content that may or may not be authoritative, reducing research outcomes? So again, there's that problem of the curation of information. Um, will researchers be information literate if they aren't equipped to use content of multiple types? Uh, the quote at the bottom there is from the uh, ALA State of America's Libraries report from 2013. Um, the Research Institute surveyed um, incoming first year college students in the fall of 20 2011 and found that 60% do not evaluate the quality or readability of information. 75% don't know how to find research articles and resources. And the quote there, 44% uh, do not know how to integrate knowledge from different sources. So there is a question about um, information literacy as well. So we've been looking into some other aspects of how uh, research is conducted online, and I'm going to hand over to Rob now to share those with you. OK, thank you. Um, I'm now going to talk about <coughs> that second theme that we covered in our survey, which was about the use of different online resources. And the overall question that we were looking to try to answer there was around how satisfied social science faculty are with the various information sources available and where their needs are not being met. The hypotheses that we wanted to test are that even though we know faculty typically say that they use Google and Google Scholar as their starting point, um, that that they still will recognize the value of library resources for teaching and research, even if that's not the first place that they go. Um, and then that there's still a role for specialized index databases um, and that comprehensive but relevant results are important to people and the faculty who make more use of specialist indexes, we thought that they would report that they would get more relevant results. Um, because the Social Sciences Portfolio at ProQuest is built on um, these venerable index databases like Sociological Abstracts and International Bibliography of Social Sciences, understanding how people use ANI databases today is very important for me. And um, we know that when 
specialised abstract and indexing services began to be put together often as printed bibliographies. They were a response to this kind of information desert where articles were locked up in hard copy journals. It would be very difficult for researchers to locate the potentially relevant content for their subject, particularly if it was published in a title that their library wasn't subscribing to. And subject index bibliographies were a way then of helping the researchers to find what they needed in this information landscape where there were few alternative options. Um, but we know clearly that doesn't apply anymore. However, um, we also know from use of statistics and um, other sources that these indexes are generally still reasonably well used. Um, and I think that's because we've got a shift to the opposite paradigm where researchers are faced with too much information. When with a simple web search on any topic that you care to research, you can find millions of resources um, from one click. Um, you get this kind of information overload. And the role that an index database can play today is about trying to help filter and refine that flow of information and get you to the content that's actually what you're looking for. And I think there's then an expectation it's going to take you to the full text. So when researchers are asked about the information challenges that they're faced um, in all sorts of um, market research um, that's been done, the type of problem that they raise, um, it's often things that I think an A&I database could help to address. This is an example from a market research study conducted in 2013 by Outsell, where not enough time is the biggest problem identified for all researchers, and particularly for faculty. So if a subject specialized index database is going to help narrow down a potentially huge result set to get somebody much more quickly to the content that they actually want, then that should be helping with a major pain point. And also on the list, you have hard to determine the quality, credibility, and accuracy of information. And in this case, for the faculty who have more experience in making that kind of determination, that's, that's less of a problem. I think that perhaps speaks more to the value of, of these resources for students, which wasn't the focus of the, the, the survey that I'm talking about today, um, but is another use case. Our survey asked people how often they used different categories of resource, um, including Google Scholar, the library website, and specialist subject indexes, uh, which we separated from Scholar Journal databases and multi-purpose platforms like searching across all of progress. Um, and we've got a poll I think we can bring up that um, is related to that question. So um, we asked people whether they used each of these resources daily, once a week or more, at least once a month, but less than once a week, rarely or never. So if you'd like to have a go at completing this poll, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. Um, the question here is what percentage of the social science faculty you responded to that they used specialized subject indices at least once a month. So that includes the people that said they use them daily, weekly, or monthly. Just pause for a moment to allow people time to complete this survey. Okay, so we've got um, a range of responses um, here, um, but perhaps concentration in that 11 to 40 percent bracket. Um, you think that they, the, the, only a minority of respondents would have said that. Um, if we go on to the next slide and see the results from across the poll. Um, the results for everything, but this, um, if you look under specialized subject indexes and the combination of the green and yellow bars, um, was actually 
two thirds, 69% of respondents reported that they were using them um, once a month or more, and only 5% said that they never used them. Um, looking across all of the um, responses and categories here, as you'd expect, general internet search is used by everyone all the time. Um, I think as, as librarians, you can be encouraged that um, even if only 18% of people so that they use the physical library once a week or more, and virtually everybody, 95%, use the library website at least once a month. Um, and and I, I was certainly encouraged by the, um, by the result that um, for specialised subject indexes, um, two-thirds or more of people claimed to be using them um, at least once a month, um, although it's only around a third of people using them on a, on a weekly basis. Um, when we controlled... Um, so, so we asked them, we asked respondents then how often they use different categories of resource, and we gave some, um, gave the examples here. Um, as you'd ex um, so that um, see whether they rank them as either good or excellent um, or um, poor for different categories: relevance of results, quality of information, comprehensiveness, or convenience and time saving um, and um, and the specialized subject indexes as well as um, scholarly journal databases multi-purpose databases all scored fairly highly on, on, on all categories but there was no um, no particular trend to show that they were seen as more relevant or higher quality compared to Google Scholar or other types of, of information unless you get to internet search engines, which, which um, many fewer people um, would say had high, very high quality information. Um, when we controlled for the, how frequently they were using these, um, then um, there was no real difference in the way the respondents ranked specialised subject indexes, um, scholarly journal databases like JSTOR or um, SAGE, or a multi-purpose platform like ProQuest or Epico Aggregation. Um, Google Scholar then looks a little bit different, where it's favoured for time saving rather than the relevance or the, the quality of the results. Again, it's not a surprising finding, but um, it's still interesting to have data backing up what we might assume or hear anecdotally. Okay, just testing the audio, there's been a few questions about um, audio problems, so hopefully you can hear me. Can you still hear me? Um, yeah, I think the sound seems generally to be okay, so I'm going to carry on. Um, I'm sorry if some people have had problems with the audio, and I'll try and speak as clearly as possible. Um, the other question we asked um, about um, online research and people's experience there was about um, whether people agreed or disagreed with a series of statements, um, whether they find it easy to identify the relevant material when researching a topic online, um, that a lot of results they'd get uh, not typically relevant for their subjects. It's important not to miss any relevant re records when searching online, that they want to be able to enter a few keywords into a search box um, rather than construct complex searches, um, and commonly use citations and abstracts to decide whether they need the full text article. Um, and I think the answers were probably what we would have anticipated overall. Um, most respondents don't want to construct complex searches um, and also don't want to miss any relevant records. Um, generally find it fairly easy overall to find, identify the relevant material, but um, relatively few people strongly agreeing with that statement. Um, and the same for um, results that they'd get were not always relevant for the subject. Um, and I then analysed those responses according to how frequently respondents used specialised subject indexes. Um, and as you can see, there's little difference for the three questions in the middle. 
um, a predictable increased agreement for the statements about um, use of citations and abstracts. Obviously, people who are using those specialised subject indexes, specialised abstract index databases, most often are most likely to say that they commonly use citations and abstracts to decide they need the full text article. Um, but the most interesting finding, I think, was the one on the left, um, that those frequently using specialist indexes, and um, that's the grey line, um, are much more likely to report they found it easy to identify relevant material. Almost 85% of those frequent users, those who use them once a week or more, um, over 70% of the people that use them at least once a month or more, um, compared with just over 50% of the respondents who rarely or never use specialised index databases. Now, correlation is not necessarily causation, but at the very least, I think that shows that um, many of the most successful researchers are making regular use of specialist indexes and that making use of different resources relevant to what it is that they want to achieve in a given um, search or research uh, task is helpful rather than relying always on the same starting point. Um, and there certainly are reasons why I'd expect people using specialised subject indexes to get more relevant results more easily. And this is an example use case of somebody looking for relevant empirical research on the formation of political coalitions, um, which is something I thought was going to be more topical in the UK this week than it turned out it actually was. Um, and a simple keyword search in worldwide political science abstracts gets you to very good relevant results straight away. Um, Again, this is just typing the two keywords into the search box, um, and you get um, scholarly results where the phrase you typed in is in the subject, in the title of your of your top results. Um, and a subject-specific database can be particularly helpful in a case like this, where you've got search terms that may mean something in another discipline, where the results are going to be completely irrelevant to your research. As you'll see, if you do the same search in Summon, Summon's a library discovery product, which is also from ProQuest, so I'm not suggesting that Summon is, you know, isn't any good. It's, um, it's, it's designed for when you want to search across the library's entire holdings, and it works very well, I think, for most use cases. Um, but for th this kind of search, when you use Summon, you would have to wade through a lot of irrelevant results that are in psychology or computer science. Um, now, you can try to use some of the refining features in Summon, but because it's drawing from lots of different underlying data sources, they're less consistent and powerful. And then once you start trying to work out how to use advanced search features and construct your search, um, that's the kind of thing that researchers say they prefer not to do. And it's easier if you begin in the right place um, to start with. Um, so here's a summary of what you get from these searches. Um, I looked at the first 35 results that you got from each search, uh, roughly what you'd appear on the first page or two of results. 89% um, of the results I got from Worldwide Political Science Abstracts were empirically focused research on the formation of political coalitions, which is what I thought um, a researcher would be after. The, the other ones were game theoretic, might be of secondary relevance. Again, it's still easy to refine that search further using filter or suggested subjects if you wanted to, but you get um, highly relevant scholarly results straight away. Um, using Summon, the version I used was from Dartmouth University, um, you get many more results, um, varying content types. I did filter out the news content, which otherwise was overwhelming, uh, or was, was um, a large percentage of the results, which was very easy to do, um, to limit to the more scholarly result types, um, but even so, um, only 11% were the kind of empirically focused research articles relating to political science that um, my hypothetical researcher was after, um, and uh, the remainder, about half of them, might have been of secondary relevance. The, uh, the other 46% were from other disciplines, computer science, psychology, that were clearly not relevant to, to that topic. Um, if you did the same search in Google, you would get some scholarly articles um, alongside Wikipedia, Amazon links, and, and so on. Um, none of that first page of results was empirical political science studies. Google Scholar, you'd get um, scholarly papers. 
Um, the initial results page, if it's sorted by relevance, is mostly the older articles which have been extensively cited um, over many years. Um, that's the way that that algorithm works. So there's no recent political science articles on that first results page. You could resort by date, um, but that introduces some different problems. And again, um, you'll get few, if any, empirical political science articles on the first page of results. So to conclude, um, let's check the hypotheses I discussed earlier against the results from the survey. I think the results did support the broad position that faculty recognise the value of library resources, even if they typically start elsewhere. Um, few respondents said that they rarely or never use those resources, and the library resources did score well on all the categories that we tested. Frequent Google Scholar users tended to score it um, as excellent for convenience whereas frequent users of library databases tended to score these as excellent for relevance of results, for quality of information. Um, and then looking at the hypotheses around specialised index databases, um, the survey results indicated that two-thirds of social science faculty are using those at least once a month. They're still clearly serving a need from that sample. Um, as we expected, respondents said that they didn't want to miss any relevant records. And although they, they do find it fairly easy to identify the relevant material overall, they will often get a lot of irrelevant results and don't want to construct complex searches. 84% um, of those who use specialised indexes once a week or more agreed that they found it easy to identify relevant results compared to just 54% of those who rarely or never use them. And I think that's probably a clearer result than we might have anticipated. Um, so what are we doing next in terms of our research? We are rerunning the survey this year. We've tweaked a few of the questions. Um, we will continue to further refine and validate our findings by talking to researchers. That's an ongoing part of the, the, the job for both Mark and myself. Um, and in terms of how we're putting some of those findings to use in our product development, then we're looking to increase coverage of source sites beyond scholarly journals, such as working papers. Um, we know that we need to continue to support access to specialised subject indexes, like sociological abstracts, as individually searchable databases in the ProQuest platform. Um, even as we move towards um, a model where more and more libraries are subscribing to those perhaps as part of a bigger package um, for the researcher, they still expect to be able to use those as individual databases. Um, and then as we continue to develop our platform experience, then supporting that user need for comprehensive but relevant results using a basic search is very much at the forefront of the, what we're thinking and the use cases that we want to support. Um, so thank you for listening today. Um, that's the end of the presentation that we have prepared. I hope you found it interesting. And we've got a bit of time now to answer any questions. Um, Mark, um, are there any that have come through on the chat that you want to address? Um, we've got one, well, we've got a few come in here. One of them says, um, do you have a breakdown of the fields that the respondents are in? So for the um, different content type survey, um, we've broken it down into the subject of interest, which has been quite broad, social sciences and business. I'm not sure if we had more detail for the other survey, Rob. We do. Um, so we did ask about um, the disciplines of the respondents from the um, original survey we did of 235 social science faculty last year. Um, and it was a mix of subjects. About 40% um, gave sociology as the primary subject. Um, 20% plus social work, and then there were some from education, economics, criminology, political science, public policy, and then a lot of people that just said other or gave different um, subjects. So um, it was a range of disciplines. Um, perhaps the sample was biased towards sociology and social work as against um, political science or economics. Uh, 
Um, another question we've got here, um, how do journal articles rank in terms of commonly used sources? I didn't see them on the list. Um, that's right. So we, um, we wanted to see the types of content that, they, that researchers used uh, in addition to scholarly journals. So um, we know that that's where they want to publish, and we know that, that they use them um, in their research. So we, we kind of took it as a given that they are using scholarly journals. The interesting um, the point of the research really was to find out what else they're using in addition. So you're right, it wasn't on the list. Um, the assumption was that, that they're all using scholarly journals. And then there's another question, what are researchers using to find more esoteric materials like working papers and conference proceedings? I think that's something we're still doing further research into. We, we hope um, and are encouraging them to use ProQuest as one source of access to some of that material and are trying to increase our coverage of that. And we index some of that material, we have some of the full text. Um, I think also, um, people get to some of that content via Google searching or they have specific sites that they use. Um, but I think it's something that we want to um, understand better. Yeah, and just in addition to that, so as I was um, talking about earlier on in the presentation, the, one of the reasons we do this research is to inform how we develop our product. So. Um, knowing that this is the type of content that researchers are using and need to access, it means it's the type of content that we're also putting into our product. So as Rob said, what we'd like um, users to do is, use Pro, uh, is to use ProQuest to find all these different content types because they're the sort of content types that we've been adding into our products uh, to make it easy for them to find within ProQuest. Then another question, any thoughts on whether scholars are using RSS feeds from databases to stay current? Um, that's not something that we've um, tested in the surveys that we've done or has been the, one of the focuses of um, research that we've done with users. I know from uh, usage statistics of our platform, um, the usage of RSS feeds and alerts is relatively low, um, but then at the same time, um, academics that we talk to will sometimes mention that as something that they use with primary publisher sites in particular with favorite journals that they will set up a feed to stay current. Um, another question has come in, are you suggesting that um, people use Google Scholar because they prefer the interface or feel uncomfortable with scholarly database interface. Um, I think it's convenience as much as anything uh, that um, people use Google every day for every search. Google Scholar is right there. They don't have to log in. Um, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to learn how to use a specialized platform or database, even if in reality um, it's, it's not difficult to learn how to use those. So, um, And that's backed up by some of the qualitative research we've done when we've asked people that question. Um, it, it's not necessarily that they um, are really uncomfortable with other databases. Um, some people will use both. Um, that they, you know, Google is there, Google Scholar is there, they'll start there, then they'll go into um, something else when they need to. Um, for other people, they, um, if, if they're happy enough with the results that they get from Google and um, aren't encouraged to go or go somewhere else by um, a colleague, by the library, um, they may stop there. There's a related question, was it, was it because, did people say Google Scholar was more convenient because they didn't know how to access databases off campus? Um, I don't think it's because they didn't know how to access databases off campus that they, that they weren't aware that that was possible. Um, 
again, and this is probably less from the faculty who we surveyed here and more about um, students uh, um, and PhD researchers who we've spoken to and, and asked this kind of question. Um, they know that the library databases are there. They know how to get them, really. But um, it, there's another couple of clicks and another couple of um, logins that they have to go through in order to get there. Um, that sometimes gets cited to us as a reason why they prefer to start somewhere else. Um, there's a question about um, that it will be helpful to people to indicate whether a given journal title is peer reviewed, which is something that's often required by professors and not easy to find. Um, yeah, I think that that is very important and that is something that um, services like ProQuest should be helping people with and we will continue to do our best to support that, um, support that need. We do have that peer review checkbox um, on all of our search pages. Um, we try to use the um, Ulrich subject guide to peer review as the um, to check on whether a given title is peer-reviewed or not. Um, question, what about digital repositories and e-journals? Um, sometimes that information is not too easy to access unless you know of the title subject. And do you see that as a possible trend in the future? Yeah, um, that's something that we um, are focusing on a little bit more in the research we're doing this year to um, try and understand better um, whether and how people are accessing open access content that is available in um, institutional repositories, um, including um, their own repository and repositories from other universities. Um, when we've spoken to people, the, the sense that we get is that, that um, they're not going into those places necessarily to find content. Um, and may not be um, as aware of their existence or the possibility of doing that as is sometimes assumed. And I think there is a, a possible trend in the future to better link people to that kind of information. Um, question about whether researchers are using Google Scholar set up so they have access to the library's full text resources, um, the resources that libraries purchase for them or not. Um, Again, um, we don't have data on that necessarily. Um, I, my understanding is that um, they, they should be using it set up that way, whether when they're accessing it outside the library and not authenticated, they necessarily always are um, set up that way. I don't know from the people that I think I've spoken to, they tend to understand. I, um, they seem to understand that they uh, that was something that the library was helping them with and that they were using Google Scholar as a route to their library's full text. Um, whether that's always true or not, I don't know. Mark, did you have any thoughts on any of these questions? I think they're well handled. I did want to point people in the direction of um, some of the resources uh, that you should be able to see on the main page. So. These findings have been uh, written up in white papers, so there's a couple linked here, um, which I hope you'll find the time to have a quick look at. There's one on um, how social scientists search for information. So that's um, a lot of the data from uh, Rob's portion of the presentation. And also the importance of non-journal resources to the social sciences researcher. So that gives a bit more detail on the um, different content types that they're using. and. Um, if anyone wants any more information on our white papers or future white papers, we um, create these quite often and we, um, and we look to share the findings uh, with librarians uh, in the form of white papers in these presentations then. Um, please subscribe to our newsletters or um, drop Rob or I an email. Uh, the email address was on one of the earlier slides. And, um, and we can make sure that you get hold of the information or if you've got any general feedback on ProQuest or any questions about anything, then please get in touch. OK, uh, great. I think that wraps things up for us today. Um, I just want to give our presenters a virtual round of applause for spending time with us and sharing some great information.
Um, and as a reminder, we have recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from us that will include instructions on how to access the archived version. Um, and I'll include the, a copy of the slides in there, too, for anyone that needs those. Um, and thanks again to all our participants for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this session and have a great rest of the day.